Great. Okay. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, today is January 29th, and this is the second Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group meeting. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and be available on YouTube. Uh, I'll be hosting today's meeting and co-hosted by Xin as well. Uh, today, we're going to go through majorly three topics. Uh, Based on last meeting's conversation, we decided decided to focus on focus on some of the subtopics. And the first topic we'd like to discuss and go through will be Andrew going through his document about volume backup. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Andrew to start sharing his doc and go through the, his ideas. Did you want to go through the whole agenda first before doing that? Because you said there's three things you wanted to talk about. Sure. The second thing is data populator. Uh, I, I think uh, Ben successfully got it merged into 118 uh, for the cap. Uh, even though the scope has shrinked a little bit, but I would like to invite Ben to go through the, the cap, what, it, what will be included. And third thing will be the workflows in data protection. Uh, Dave, me, Shin, Tom, and Nona. Uh, there's another person I forgot to add his, her name over here. I'm sorry, please add it by, by yourself. Uh, we went through some of the topics. There's a very raw document came up by Dave at this point of time. It's shared across the board. Uh, it is still in working in progress. We'll go through some of the items we have discussed as well. Was, was it shared to the mailing list? I think so. It's probably not yet, right? Yeah, I don't uh, remember can, can you, can you, do you have access to it? It's, it's listed on the agenda. I did. Yeah, it's I on did. the agenda. I can just send it out to the working group. Okay. All right. Cool. Let's get started. Okay. Uh, let's start from Andrew. All right. Oh, just a minute. Can everyone also add your name to the attendees on the agenda? Thanks. Oh, so difficult. I'm lucky to be able to share it all, much less <laughs> figure out how to swap. Okay. Uh, all right, looks like I have to do some magic to get Zoom to be able to do this. All right. Zoom will not be able to record until it is quit. I don't care about recording. Uh, you were saying you can't share? Oh, that's um, No, no, it's just that it, it, my Mac requires some permissions to be set. Oh. Yeah, actually, if we're, if we're not recording, uh, Shane, can you turn on recording? No, it is recording. It is recording. I'm recording right. It says right it now. wants to record this computer's screen. Oh, that's, um, that's and then, uh, and then I uh, shoot. Okay, so if not, then I can let's see if I can. I can so share you know what it can. says? It says that um, I have to quit Zoom and restart. Uh, oh, I think that's that's uh, okay. That's not because of our Zoom. That's your. I think I have this issue. I have to go through something to get it fixed. Um, how about right now? Okay, I'll, I'll, just quit and I'll just quit and pop back on. I'll be right back. Okay. I, it's weird as well. I cannot share my screen. You guys see only. Is, is, uh, do you have this problem in other Zoom meetings? Because I no, had I this don't. problem. I have to do some update of Chrome and Zoom and back and forth. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't have anything like this before. Okay. Right now, at least the Zoom shows up all blank. Hmm. Okay, who is sharing? So that's me. Yeah, we're, waiting for, we're waiting for Andrew. Is Andrew, we can see your it, screen now. Is this Andrew? Right. Okay, all right. Okay, yeah. All right, so right. let me get my doc up. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. All right, let me try to, since I'm sharing my whole screen, let me try to make this a little less. And. All right, well, we'll, we'll go with this and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see. So, um, so general, um, I, I know probably most folks have read it, but let me just kind of overview what I was trying to do with it, um, because that's going to be part of the substance of my response to some of these comments. 
So I, I did a, a background section on here, which was really um, just to make this document standalone. I didn't really expect that this stuff in this background would be new to anybody who's been tapped into the working group. So um, uh, I, I uh, the, the really any better framing of this background is what I would expect in uh, the stuff that, that Dave and Sean are, are, are working on, right? Which is the overall workflow. So I, I, I appreciate all the comments here, but I wasn't really trying to <laughs> just, just basic framing. So if anyone has any issue with the basic framing, I'd be happy to address that, but that wasn't really the, the main purpose of this section. Um, it was to sort of be an exhaustive list of what we're trying to do or anything like that. Um, having said that, does anybody, is anybody really married to some change they'd like to see in this section? I think we can find, we're fine with that section. Uh, right. Let's focus on the water and backup stuff. Right, that right. Okay, so, so then the, the, the final paragraph here is, is to basically say that, um, there, that we need to define what we mean by volume backups themselves, right? So, uh, and then with a goal, and I've said this sort of implicitly and maybe explicitly in a couple of places, um, I am under the assumption that we want the volume backup ecosystem to be like the volume snapshot ecosystem in which the implementation of backups is not in Kubernetes, but rather the API for backups is in Kubernetes. And the implementations are expected to be some form of plugin or controller or something that is provided by third parties um, to actually implement this. And so one of the things that I've been trying to, to kind of deal with in the discussion here is the difference between those things that we need to specify as, as in we, we want to the users to be able to say blah, no matter who the backup supplier is, um, versus those things that are, can be hidden inside the volume backup implementation itself. So that's one of the, the nuances in here. And of course, part of the problem is I felt like we needed to define volume backups. So I give a lot of sort of characteristics of volume backups, not because all of those would necessarily manifest in an API, but because when we start talking about what the API should be, I wanted to make sure that everybody had the same view of what needs to be supportable via the API. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Yes, no to me. That sounds pretty good to me. This is Tom from Kasten. I did have kind of a higher level question flash point. I, I think it might be worth calling out the different roles here compared to taking volume snapshots. So in, in the backup community, um, I think Kasten's kind of point of view is that there'd be multiple parties, multiple roles involved. So if you look at CSI, CSI is an interface defined um, and implemented, defined by Kubernetes and implemented by different storage providers. In the backup case, um, Kind of what I was envisioning was that there'd be backup providers like Kasten that would uh, kind of consume the interface, much like the snapshot controller consumes the uh, CSI interface. Um, and then the storage providers could implement whatever that API was. Um, and what's different here is rather than having kind of the community develop a snapshot controller, there'd be third party um, vendors that would be the backup vendors, right? The data protection vendors. Does that, does that kind of match what your understanding is, is it worth calling out those roles explicitly? Oh, this, is, this is exactly, I think, one of the topics that I wanted to talk about. So let me make sure that I am understanding your view and, and let me do it by way of sort of explaining how I've looked at this. Yeah, please. P part of this is um, there's two different problems that kind of intersect here. And I don't, maybe I didn't do a great job of talking about the two of them. One of them is the degree to which the general backup problem is distinct from the volume backup problem, 
right? Mm -hmm. and, and several of the comments on this doc were really referring to the general backup problem. Things like application quiesce, things like um, capturing, you know, the config uh, in addition to the volume data. Uh, and I've been explicitly viewing volume backup as a layer on which any kind of sort of workload or cluster or application backup would be based. So it could use that as a as an underlying facility. So it would have a well-defined API for how to do that. So in, in, with that in mind, I actually imagined that we'd have the following roles, which is underlying primary storage, including snapshot support, right? All in one, one component. Yeah. A volume backup uh, component, which might be provided by primary storage, or could be provided by a, a different plugin that relied on something from the primary storage, either snapshot or we've talked about this other things, these what would have been called incremental snapshots, the sort of feeding of deltas into a system. Um, but then also a third layer, which is the layer that orchestrates the overall backup process. Um, and the rationale for the difference between that second and third layer, which, oh, by the way, of course, all of those layers, all of those roles could collapse and be provided by a single vendor, right? So yeah. you could imagine a, a storage provider might want to be storage back, uh, you know, volume backup and overall backup. Um, uh, but you, you can also imagine that the problems involved with managing cross-cluster backups um, is a bit of a different problem than backing up volumes. Uh, in particular, since it, I know of at least several of the storage vendors um, have actually the capability to do volume backups. Absolutely. Yeah. But don't have the capability to do the larger backup problem. So, so this is picking that very specific line and talking about just volume backups and pushing off a bit the question of that higher level backup. And I several folks had comments around that. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. So I think that's um, a great characterization. Um, you know, you talk about the three layers. Um, so I, I can give you my kind of opinion on the three layers and then we can beat, it, beat up my opinion as a group, right? So if, if the layer, if we're talking about the lowest level layer, the first one you talked about, where you have uh, a storage provider implementing backup solution, I don't know if there's, too much work that we would have to define as a SIG for that. I think, you know, if I'm if I'm a storage provider, I could, for example, just define a CRD and have that configure how, for example, I push my storage of a backup of my storage to like S3 or something like that, right? Um, you know, I'm not sure we need to define a standard that would uh, capture that. I, I actually disagree. I, I think that that's the thing that we should standardize, but yeah, that, I, I, and, and, and the reason why, let me, let me just go a little bit further into that. If sure. there is a layer that wants to be able to invoke such a thing, yeah. there is value in having that thing be invocable in the same way, whether it's provided by primary storage or by different primary storage vendors, or whether that volume backup layer itself is provided by another component. Sure. That, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, well, there's a difference between invocation and configuration. That's true. So right now, like CSI, for example, gives you the opportunity to say, hey, I want a durable snapshot. I think that's, that's, what, you've heard. that's what we started calling them. And then it's up to the storage system to figure out how to actually migrate that out to secondary storage. But we've already got an API for that, which is relatively simple. It may need some tweaking here. The problem with that API is it only works for primary storage. It doesn't allow for, one of the problems with that API is that it doesn't actually allow for any kind of model like say a Restic style backup. Exactly, no, that's, that's exactly true. And so, but I've been working on separating these two into like two different silos. So we've got stuff that happens under the covers essentially like the durable snapshots. And I think that's gonna be, we, we have a way to trigger that. We may need to, to change the way we trigger it, but a lot of the internals of that, like, like for example, like in, in EBS or I don't know what the Google Cloud equivalent is called, we're not gonna be able to swap out the durable snapshot provider there. 
that's baked into EBS. It's really tightly integrated, and it's unlikely they'll ever they'll ever open that up per se. Uh, so so again, if you're going to do a Restic style backup, you absolutely could do but, that. Well, no, because Restic is coming in from the top. So right. we've got right. two different models, right? So one is, one is, hey, you know, storage system, go take care of this for me. The other is, hey, backup system, you need access in order to get this data out, in order to either move it or, you know, basically to move it, to put it in, put it somewhere else. These are secondary storage, a destination target, whatever it is. So that's, that's how I'm seeing these two silos. But, but, but it would be really nice if there was one API that could do both of those things. I'm not saying it's possible. But, but, but that, that, that is exactly what, what it, when we get into the discussion of the APIs, <laughs> that, is what, that is what I will be proposing is a single API that does both of those. We, we have ourselves here um, a proof of concept of that. So we think it's possible to do that. Okay. So this would push things up into like the Kubernetes layer rather than, you know, just relying on everything in the storage or are we expecting right. the storage so, provider? So the stay? idea is that in the Kubernetes layer, you would manifest a lot of the questions of what, what it means to be a backup, et cetera. But then you would want to be able to provide really different types of underlying implementation, including one that might plumb right through CSI. Uh, so, Andrew, I see that as kind of your third, uh, your third layer, the characterization that you, you defined over the top, right? So I think when you, maybe I misunderstood your original characterization, but it sounded like you defined kind of three layers, like the storage layer itself, what does it mean to back that up? I think storage vendors will have their own opinion there. Um, the middle layer, I think, is what we've been thinking about a lot at Kasten, which is how do we uh, get the actual blocks themselves and put them into our uh, backup storage system? Um, and then the third layer on top of that is how do you kind of orchestrate, if I want to back up, say, my namespace, what do I have to do to go back up all these separate components, whether they're the volumes or, or the, you know, the, the um, Kubernetes, YAMLs, uh, the specs, all those kind of things. So I don't think we're actually disagreeing at a top level what the characterization of the layers are. Yeah. Uh, I think that maybe when we just start getting into API discussions, we'll flesh out what differences we might have. Absolutely. Yeah. That is, you know, the, the difference is probably just in the nuance of what is the API to the second layer versus the first layer. And, you know, I, I was envisioning that the API to the first layer would be storage and snapshots, not backups. And the API to the second layer is backups that would rely on the first layer capabilities. And that the third layer is that that aggregate backup, where you know, just just the way you articulate. That's, that's true, but there is some nuance there, right? So the current snapshot APIs, for example, don't have any data path uh, components. You know, so things like change block tracking, um, and in fact, just de general data extraction. Um, I can give you an example. So what what Kasten does right now, if we're using CSI, is we take a backup or store it, and then extract the data out of. Yep, exactly. Rehydrate yes. block. Yep, that's, and well, you don't take a backup, you take a snapshot. I'm sorry, a snapshot, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, and that, that is the de facto way to do that now, but there is on the table for this working group some enhancement at that level, right? Absolutely. To ask primary storage to expose additional, what I will call snapshot-related APIs. The fact that they exist for the purpose of backup may be the nuance. <laughs> But I would, I would probably describe the nuance snapshot as, APIs rather than backup APIs. That's all. I'd probably describe the nuance as data, like snapshot data path versus snapshot maybe control path. Right? Um, sure. In this case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow, we pretty much I think covered a lot of the, <laughs> the conversation that was in the doc. So. Really, if anybody else has anything else they want to bring up about that, I mean, uh, a difference of opinion about those layers. Um, what, Andrew, how much more detail do you have on the API? You said you had done a proof of concept? Yes, uh, we, we have a proof of concept. We, are, we don't yet have permission to um, open that up. Uh, uh, we're working on that. Um, but, I, but I, I, can, I, can talk, I can talk through the details. It's basically okay. a volume backup CRD, right? With a, you know, it looks, 
it looks similar to volume snapshots. Um, some of the differences that we at least expose a little more explicit configuration uh, in things like uh, target and stuff like that. Okay. I, I was going to say, I had exactly the same idea back in November and I followed exactly the same path that, that you did. And I have, I also have a proof of concept that I don't have permission to release, but, <laughs> but, it, but it sounds like, it sounds like we're on the same page. And so yeah. I, I'm very curious about the exact implementation decisions you made, because I, I do think that is a promising path. Um, um, obviously I agree. Okay. <laughs> Is this, there was a KEP a while ago with um, like backup class and I think uh, Jean Kian worked on this, right? Is this um, related to that or is it different? Oh uh, yeah, this, this was, this is all my team. Um, and yeah, we had an earlier cut at this. Um, and this, yeah, what we're doing now represents an evolution of that. I see and you and I are from the same team, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. Uh, I, I do have a question for you, Andrew, even though we are from the same team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the tricky things is to management life cycle. Uh, could you go a little bit deep, uh, deep in that aspect of the backup? So um, I, I'm guessing it why Sean is asking me to answer this question. So, um, you know, one of the things that you know, if if you are if you come from a, a, a historic enterprise storage environment, uh, it, it might be a little surprising to learn that volume snapshots in Kubernetes are actually supposed to have some degree of lifecycle difference from their volumes, because that a lot of times is not kind of how snapshots are really implemented, right? They're kind of metadata in the same thing, and there isn't always an expectation that a snapshot would stick around when the volume does. But one thing that's certainly not an expectation is that the snapshot would stick around if the physical device that was holding the volume goes away. Uh, now, of course, we have uh, implementations of snapshots that in fact are effectively backups, right? So the cloud vendor snapshots, the EBS, the, the PD, are effectively actually backup. But um, so one of the things that I was trying to get at um, around the lifecycle stuff is things like, hey, the ID that gets assigned to a backup needs to be an ID that has global scope so that either by itself or when coupled with a location, it uniquely identifies it uh, independent of the particular storage pool that may have created it or that you want to import it into. So the existing snapshot IDs only have to be unique within a cluster. And the idea is these would have to be effectively globally unique. It also has to be explicitly po possible to import export into different clusters backups, right? And then of course, now we get into the nuance of different kinds of backups because we can imagine um, backups that are completely portable between storage vendors, i.e. a RESTIC class backup, or backups that while they're independent of a particular storage pool, they might not be independent of a particular storage technology. So, hey, I have my file system built in the following way, and so I'm the only one who's going to be able to interpret my backups, right? That doesn't mean I have to come back into this same appliance or this same uh, you know, distributed file system, but it would need to be back to my product, you know, something like that. Um, so I, I guess the key thing then is that you should be able to nuke the original volume and the backup should, should be just as useful you should be able to nuke the original cluster and the backup should be just as useful. Um, uh, of course, there's a bunch of other considerations here too, like um, backup lifetime. Once you've separated the life cycle from the individual volume, you start getting into interesting questions about versioning and um, you know, how long can you keep a backup and be able to expect to be able to recover from it? And what do we want to say about that? 
Um, and there, there's also yeah, the, and, the issue yeah, of, of cleaning up garbage over time, right? If no or, one or not, or not cleaning up. <laughs> Cleaning, cleaning up is definitely one of the things. Uh, and another interesting issue, just on top of what Andrew just described, it's unlike uh, everybody knows right now in the snapshot API, we have this interesting retention policy. And this retention policy, yeah, it does apply to cloud providers like PD, uh, EBS, et cetera. However, it may not necessarily apply to local storage systems because once you delete the volume, uh, theoretically, some of the storage vendors may not necessarily have the implementation that you they can keep the snapshot around once the volume is gone. Yeah, so they end up having to create like shadow volumes and things like weird things like that. Exactly, okay. and this also applies to backup as well. So that's the reason why I want to toast this problem out, uh, this kind of you know interesting question out. The reason why I'm asking is since the life cycle is somehow um, life cycle management of backup seems to be a mix of within the cluster you can manage it and outside the cluster you can manage it. Now it leads to a very interesting question which is a dangling reference from an existing backup object. Let's say you define some API, right, in the original cluster and somebody else deleted the external storage of the backup. What happened to that object? Do we, do we plan to do anything or just let it be dangling there? Right, there's also the flip of that which is you have a cluster, you backed it up, you've surfaced some snapshot IDs there, and you're managing them in that cluster. Now you restore to another cluster. You don't delete the first cluster, but you keep the second cluster. Now those same snapshot IDs have surfaced in the second cluster. Who gets to delete those? Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I was, yeah. <clears throat> no, it's the flip of it, because you're talking about, and, and your, your point is a very good one as well, which is you know the external storage deleted them. But here we've got two competing clusters who both have ownership, because we don't share PVs between clusters typically, right? That's right. Uh, and there's, there's the third problem of I, I backed it up, and then I nuked the cluster, and I lost the reference to the backup. Uh, and now it's out there somewhere. <laughs> Right now, so I, I, I will tell you how I am viewing this. <laughs> and again, this is open for discussion. It's not a, right. Um, but uh, when I think of what is that layer three responsibility, it includes a lot of these kinds of things. Uh, because we, you, it's very gonna be very difficult to understand intent at a volume backup and recovery level Whereas a larger level aggregate sort of backup, restore, um, you know, with, with some sort of uh, life cycle management of the things that are not in clusters themselves, right? So that has an entire system of stuff that you have to worry about um, that could be from Kubernetes, could be managed from, manageable from Kubernetes, but could be managed outside of Kubernetes as well that's I kind of see as a natural problem for that third layer. I agree with you, but, but we still need to have the APIs in the volume backup layer that lets that third layer control things. I agree. Yep. I had a question for this group. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking, I th Andrew, so you, part, of your, part of your document is kind of maybe proposing an opinion on what these things are. I think it'd be reasonable to be relatively opinionated. Um, and maybe one of the things that uh, some of you were getting at was that perhaps backups maybe um, we enforce kind of an independence, right? We, we, when we talk about a backup, um, it would not be tied to the original volume, for example. I can, you know, we, we said that the life cycle would be independent. Um, and maybe that has implications on what's in the current, um, like snapshotting APIs where retention maybe perhaps makes less sense for that. And um, we would move that into some kind of backup API. Uh, yeah, I, I would certainly support <laughs> relaxing some of the life cycle uh, requirements of snapshot if that was possible. I don't know if it is. I don't think that should be the case. I think the volume backup, that should be independent of the original yeah. volume, but for snapshot is different. Actually, uh, we are actually looking at uh, whether we need to make them, uh, how to say? More restricted. Yeah, yeah more restricted because <laughs> what happens is a lot of, uh, well, a lot of storage systems actually have that snapshot 
uh, on those volumes when the volumes has those snapshots you can't you cannot delete the volumes mm -hmm. so the worker yes a lot i don't know uh, what storage you have been using but actually a lot of storage system most storage system actually if you just count on the numbers there is a just dependency um so uh, i actually see a lot of people complaining our current snapshots api that <laughs> because right now the api uh, assumes that they are independent so some uh, csi drivers actually implement some lot of logic like Ben's uh, drivers, right? Um, you actually have to manage this one at the driver layer, um, assume that the volume can be deleted successfully, but actually it's not. <laughs> and then you can keep this reference count <laughs> internally within a driver, but it's definitely a problem that I actually want to make this experience better for those drivers. Uh, so I don't think they should be, it's already, right now it's actually, um, already has different life cycles because it actually, a Kubernetes API allow you to delete the volumes, even though there are sna still snapshots on it, which is not allowed by a lot of storage systems. Well, I But you do have to, yeah, but you do have to do a lot of things in, at your driver level to, uh, you know, right. to hide so that, guess, to hide yeah, that dependency, right? I didn't really understand your saying no, because I, I thought the, 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 the sort of initial proposal there was, maybe we should revisit that requirement of volume snapshots to make it easier for those because we're now going to provide that life cycle independence with volume backups. Well, it yeah, we, we, we definitely could, yeah, we definitely should revisit that, but that's for volume uh, backup. I'm not, um, but I don't think- I, I guess- The life cycle between snapshot and volume can be- the, 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 the issue there is that yeah, no. snapshots are already in beta and changing it is going to be difficult. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. We, we can still change Ben, but just difficult. Yeah, right? but we need to have a reason. We need to have a yeah. reason. I, I, I would be against it. I, I haven't heard <laughs> enough reason to say why they should be completely. What is the, so uh, also actually Tom originally mentioned this. So what are you proposing? Uh, that uh, so they should be completely independent? It's not still not independent enough. Uh, well, the CSI snapshots are, um, you know, I think cover kind of both the cloud use cases, which is more like a backup, mm -hmm. and also yeah. the uh, standard volume cases. Right. I think what we're talking about here is maybe adding a new type of API which supports backups. And so if we can separate the two, it would... Oh, it might... uh, so that's, I think that's exactly what Andrew is trying to propose, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's fine, yeah. So, but, exactly. uh, and, yeah. And, and that second part should be done. The question is, after we do that, can we also change the way snapshots work? And I mean, I, Shing's point is well taken that almost everybody has this problem. We do have a workaround that, in my opinion, isn't terrible. But yeah, yeah you, well, you have to play games. I have to ask you, I have asked you, so can you uh, show us an example in your driver? And you are saying, oh, the driver, our driver is too complicated for people to understand. So no, they, <laughs> you they, know, they, I say, okay, here is a sample presentation how you can solve this problem. <laughs> I, don't even I, I would be happy to write a blog article on how like NetApp solved this problem in particular, if that would be helpful to people. But, yeah, if, but still, it's, it's, oh, unnatu it's unnatural, right? So it's basically, <laughs> basically it, it's, it's against the, uh, whatever the relationship is, is there is a dependency. You are basically you assume that, to, pretend that there's a, no dependency, right? Yeah. You have to be able to do a soft delete and, and deal with yeah, the implications I, of that. I, I, I don't see why we should add do, so much burden to CSI drivers. Do we have a feel yet for how many people are actually consuming snapshot API or planning to consume it? And, you know, if we, if we introduced a breaking change, who would that affect? Do we know that? So that's it, a good question. This particular I, feature. <laughs> yeah. You can ask a pain, right? Ben already exper experienced the wrong alpha to beta chain. Right. Right. We got a lot of requests to support out. alpha APIs actually. <laughs> 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 so ben, I'm sorry so want to, I already, I have already seen a lot of people started contributing to the snapshot feature after it goes beta. Many, many people that I have ne never seen before. So I'm pretty sure we, we it's beta. Like, after backups come out, we could deprecate the lifecycle stuff and snapshots and take a while to have that go. Uh, why, what, what do you mean deprecate the lifecycle? I mean, you, you mean make them dependent or make them, what, what is that exactly what you're trying to deprecate? So, so I, what I'm saying is once volume backups get out there, we can tell people if you want your lifecycle to stay separate, we suggest volume using volume backups, not volume uh, snapshots. Because okay. at some future point, 
we're going to relax the restriction that the, of this life cycle. Requirement. Yeah, but, but that, that doesn't solve the problem of all the storage vendors who are trying to implement the snapshot feature today ah, right. with the existing yes. semantics. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and have, to, have to do the hard thing. My, my primary, my primary <laughs> desire would be to relax that as soon as volume backups is available, or maybe even earlier. I relax, think that, right. uh, uh, relax uh, which well, one? Relax snapshot? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. If, if we are uh, stuck with implementing a feature or a change that is going to break backwards compatibility, I think history teaches us that we should do that sooner rather than later, because with the rapid adoption cycle of Kubernetes at the moment, we are going to see a wider uh, sphere of impact the longer we wait. I don't think I don't think we are proposing to deprecate anything. There are some, but we can revisit the existing well, API and see what can be improved, what it cannot. The, I think the, it's, the it's specific... really too early to talk I mean, about deprecation at this point. No, no, the, 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 there, there's a change that would make this less painful, which is to say that at the Kubernetes layer, if you try to delete a snapshot or try to delete a volume that still has snapshots, we could say, we will not do that. We will keep it alive. Yeah, yeah. That, that and, makes and, sense. and that would be a Kubernetes change that we that's, could make. That, that is to make it more strict, right? I, I was sorry. I'm hearing Andrew yeah. saying the opposite. I was confused. No, 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 no. no. I, Andrew was saying about relaxing the lifecycle management in the backup. Okay. Yeah, we don't even have it at there yet, right? So it's a new. No, no, no. Wait, what I was saying <laughs> is is basically supporting the standard what people would expect from snapshot which is that life cycle of your snapshot is tied to life cycle of your backup if the right way to do the that without uh, well, uh, not yeah. back no, uh, volume. Well, volume yeah if the right way yeah. to do that is to not allow volume deletion uh while you have active snapshots i think that's a fine approach yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, I, okay, I agree. So we can definitely, I, we can re revisit this one at a later point. I don't think we, I, I we need to look at the, the backup. No, uh, on on that question, but I, I, we are I, almost I, 42 minutes into this. And you that's, have that's, oh, oh, that's a really okay. to try the to next step yeah, for this. I already put an action item in the working group uh, document. Uh, let's move on to Ben's. Uh, okay. Whether you got into the cap, okay. Andrew, can you stop sharing? Thanks. Oh yeah, I I, uh, I don't have anything to to share per se, and, and this shouldn't take too long. I just wanted to uh, to mention that you know, while developing my prototype for a way to do backup and trying to answer some of the same questions that Andrew is trying to answer. I ran into the problem of you know if you create a CRD that that represents a backup and you want to be able to restore from it. The, the natural way to do that in Kubernetes is to use that CRD as the data source for a PVC, but Kubernetes doesn't let you do that. Um, and so I, I started thinking about what we've known for a while that, that we had this concept of, you know, data populators and various ways of, you know, creating a volume that where you expect it to not be empty when you start using it. And, uh, and this is a perfect use case. So I, I uh, prototyped, you know, an implementation I actually have multiple implementations. I have like a hello world populator, you know, a backup restore populator, uh, some other, you know, just test populators written in like Python to prove, prove the concept. Um, and so I, I created a cap for Kubernetes 118 to initially to, to talk about the whole populators idea and to make my proposal for this is how populators should work. Working with uh, Tim and Saad, they, they recommended that we limit the scope of the cap to just say, okay, what we're gonna do is create a new alpha feature gate that will basically disable validation of that data source field so that we can do the experiments and prototypes and you know figure out what data populators should be in the 118 timeframe. Um, and then before, before that feature would ever move to beta, we would have to answer all these other questions, but we're intentionally punting on like what is a data populator? How does a data populator work in the 118 timeframe? And just focusing on, you know, re relaxing the API validation that currently prevents us from even trying things in that area. Um, and that kept got approved yesterday. Um, so I'll, I'll be adding the code to Kubernetes with, with the new alpha feature gate that basically will just open up the data source field so you can shove any old CRD in there. And then what actually happens when you do that is um, 
if you have like a dynamic provisioner running it as a CSI driver, if it sees a data source that it doesn't know, if it's not a volume, if it's not a snapshot, it'll just ignore it. And so in the short term, if you turn on this feature gate and you create your own CRD and then you use that as the data source for a PVC, the system just ignores it. It'll just sit there and wait. So the external provisioner ignores a provisioning request if it contains a data source it doesn't understand? Correct. Yeah, it says, it says oh, I don't know this, and it just waits, which is perfect because uh, the, the implementation of data populators that I propose uh, involves a, a separate controller also watching PVCs, seeing that request and saying, oh, I know what to do here, and then creating a volume, populating it, and then binding it to that PVC Using, By the way, that's exactly the way ours works too. Oh, wonderful. So it's great minds think alike. Ben, um, ben just a <laughs> minor thing for the external provisioner. If I didn't remember it wrongly, if uh, the external provisioner saw a source that it doesn't recognize, it does populate some error. Yes, it, yes, it, it will, uh, well, yeah, it might generate an event on the PVC that says, it, I don't know what's going on. It's not going to accept it. it right now, there is in the external provision, there are some checks. So you need to check. get rid of those checks if, <laughs> if the feature yeah, you gate You need is, to modify the external provision as such that the privacy is not showing some unrelated information as well, I guess. Well, so, so but here's the, here's the thing, and, and this, is, this was Tim's point about, about this, the, the valid API validation is, is we don't want to have a situation where the, you know, the, the user creates a, a CRD or creates a CR and then uses it as the data source for a PVC and then nothing happens because of course they haven't installed a data populator that knows what to do with that CRD. And then it, the system just sits there and they get no feedback. Like that, that is undesirable. We, we, we want to give them feedback that says, Hey, this might never complete because we don't know what to do with it. Um, well, but where, where does that feedback come from? It, it should not come from the external probation at all. Well, it, that is, that is one of the TBD items it is, you know, I, I envision a future where, you can have any CRD you want be the source of a data populator, and you can have lots of different controllers that know how to handle different CRDs. And, and over time, this could become a, you know, a very featureful area where you can pre-populate your, your volumes with, with whatever, you know, from whatever source. And people could do really interesting things conceivably. Um, but but there's always, there's always the, the possibility yeah. that like that controller hasn't been installed on that cluster, and therefore it's never going to succeed. And you kind of like to know that so you don't just sit there waiting. So, so the, what alerting mechanism can we use for that? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So we've got like, like with pods, for example, you say if the pods are not coming up, you go to the pod, you say describe pod, and you'll get some bad error messages, but you can usually do that. Can we do the same thing on the PV? And we can say, hey, the PV is not being instantiated. Let me go. We could have that. We could PVC. have events. External yeah, yeah, so, can generate events if the time well, is it, not recognizable. And I believe that's what it does today. And so that's yeah. what I'm saying is that the existing yeah. behavior is not bad. It does say, hey, I don't know what this is. And so I'm not going to do anything with it. And that should be a, a heads up to anyone who's expecting something to happen that maybe they forgot well, to install something. Yeah. yeah, my point is that even though you install the corresponding populate, the external uh, provision oh. is still not going to do the work. Yes. It doesn't yeah, matter. So so, so that, that's the missing piece is, is after you do install a provisioner that does know how to handle a specific CRD, in that case, you don't want the external provisioner to generate that warning. And we've got that's to figure right. that out. Yeah. And the other point I also, you know, uh, commented on the doc is when we, when we designed this, uh, there's an interesting thing. How do you envision the external pro populator to work? At the end of the day, <laughs> what it will require is it will, it will still need to call some CSI driver to provision a volume, right? Okay, so I, yeah, afraid, I, I, I don't. This, yeah, go ahead. I, so we don't have we don't have tons of time in this meeting, so I'll just I'll just briefly throw out what my uh, proposal does. Sure. Um, and, and 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 I want to emphasize that like we were going into a rat hole on the the KEP review on this exact subject, and that's why Tim and Saad said, hey, let's 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 pull that out of scope for this release and just say, hey, we're going to allow the data source and then we'll figure out the how later. So because this is, this is a rat hole. But uh, my approach was the, the populator controller that's watching the, the PVC and it sees a data source of some CRD that it knows how to handle. What it, what it will do then is it will create a second PVC in a different namespace with no data source. 
but all the other details are exactly the same so that the CSI driver will see that request and say, oh yeah, I know how to handle that. Go create an empty volume. And then, and then the, 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 so the populator will wait for that to happen. Then it will attach a pod to that empty volume, do whatever it needs to do to make the data appear. And then it's just a matter of deleting that PVC and rebinding the, the now populated PV back to the original PVC that the, that the user created and is still waiting for a PVC to get bound or a PV to get bound to. So you have the whole delayed provisioning stuff too, right? Hmm. Yeah. It's a copy of the implementation. If you're, if you're provisioning, if you're populating as fast enough, they don't, nobody notices anything, right? You just, they, they create a PVC, the, no, the external provisioner sure. sees it and ignores it. The populator sees it and does something. It rebinds the PV and boom, you're off and, and running with the PVC full now of data. It's the whole which comes first, volume or workload, right? <laughs> oh, but, but yeah, but, but that doesn't matter. Kubernetes can handle whatever order you whatever order you, you pick because it's just a pod and, and a PVC and, and the pod won't try to attach to the PVC until it's bound and it won't be bound until the populator controller performs the rebind. Now, I, I think Andrew was asking about what about topology? If you ask a PVC, a PVC to be scheduled on a specific machine, a spe specific no node, where do you even mount uh, your popular part? Uh, well, uh, yeah, so, so th there's, there's the, the, the trick that when you create that second PVC that with no data source, it had better have all of the same details. Exactly. You see, so that it ends up exactly where it's supposed to be. And after you, you perform the, the rebind, you don't have a useless PV. You have what, what you were expected to get. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah we're, <laughs> okay. So again, sounds awfully similar to what we've got. So. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. So 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 the the intent is get this alpha feature gate in so that we can use CRs when you enable this feature, and then we'll we'll propose many different ways of doing this, and hopefully as a community we'll settle on the one that we like, and then and then that that's a prerequisite for moving this this feature to beta, is that we better agree on something. That we're all happy with. <laughs> so if we had a volume backup CRD, I don't see why that cannot be a just like a data source like PVC or snapshot and then have oh. the external provisioner handle it. So so the way the way that we've done data sources so far is we have two of them. We have we have volumes and we have snapshots and each one has its own feature gate that's gone through alpha, beta, and not yet GA. We could do the exact same thing for backups. We could have a third feature gate mm -hmm. go through alpha, but 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 th this is never going to end, right? We're gonna have, <laughs> we're I, gonna I actually, I actually slightly disagree on that, because the the whole point of backup, at least what what is proposing in Angel Stock is about portability. It is not that reasonable to let external provisioner to understand all these backup mechanisms and leave no room for backup vendors to kick in, right? So. No, well, okay. So, 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 and again, I, I, we, we could schedule another meeting, and I could go over that. Yeah. The, the, the details of. So, so my proposal did envision backups that could be implemented either in a generic way that was vendor agnostic, or down inside the CSI driver. And in That's fact, right. I even envisioned a way that maybe they could interact with each other, so that you could do the backup with the vendor CSI driver and do the restore with the generic thing, conceivably. Um, Okay, uh, uh, thanks, Ben. <laughs> and uh, if you do have some doc to share, please uh, put it into the working group doc so that we can take a look at your input. Yeah, if, if people are interested in this there's style. A, there's a link, I, right? There's a, there's a, that's the poor request. Yeah, I don't have you this, have another uh, one? This POC. No, I, I haven't. I, so I have a, I've released a, a sample provisioner called Hello Provisioner that, that just demonstrates this, you know, this whole mechanism of. Yep. That is in that cap, right? I believe that's in the cap already. Yeah, right? but, but I, removed, I removed it at Tim's request. Oh. So I, I can make a, I mean, okay. the code's still there. I can provide can, a link. Can you just add a link in this agenda doc? Yeah. Sure, sure. And, and, all, right. and all, the, all the other stuff I hope will eventually also be released and I can, and I, and I can talk about it before then if, if you want. Um, but I'll, yeah. uh, I'll okay. let you yeah, guys move on with the agenda. I, I'd really ask that um, you schedule a, another, uh, a separate meeting that we can be part of and, and ask you and present it and ask questions because our, our bi-weekly cadence here is going to be too slow for all these things that are moving so fast. That's right. Yeah, we can actually, um, we can actually have weeklies. It just, I mean, there's another meeting that happens like monthly at the same time. Uh, we just uh -huh. need to avoid that one. And then other than that, we can actually have weekly meetings if we want for now. So 
Uh, I'll, okay, I'll just check. I'll, I'll, have, I'll check uh, the. Yeah, we have five uh, minutes left. So, Dave, your turn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, um, so data protection workflows. So we did have a very good meeting uh, last week. Um, we had a very good discussion, and I think we need to start getting a little more disciplined about working through exactly what what we're doing and who's doing what. So. Um, I would schedule, I'll schedule another meeting or some shot can schedule another meeting. We'll do that together. Um, kind of at the high level, um, we have a document, uh, where's the document? I just had the document. Um, dang it. Um, yeah. Uh, in any case, we have a, a document I started that is, uh, definitely rough. And uh, let me see if I can share that. I think what, so we've got basically, let's see if I can share, can I share a screen? Uh, I think that's, yeah, that's it. So um, I wanted to start with defining scenarios that we're trying to uh, defend against. And this is something where I really encourage everybody to toss in whatever it is you think that, you know, we need to be doing here for, for backup restore. And I'd really like input from the existing DP vendors who got, you know, the background for what, you know, what really happens out in the real world and, and things that may not be captured here. Um, and so we've got uh, a set of those, um, started defining what objects would be protected. And uh, then from there, we're going to try and define what the actual workflow would be in terms of like our existing APIs. Um, and that way we should be able to see where we have gaps. Like for example, people were talking about, Hey, you know, at some point you've got to restore the snapshot ID into Kubernetes. Where does that get stored? How do you store it? So we're going to call those out as we go through the workflows. And then we should be able to see where we have gaps in the APIs or even gaps in what and how we're thinking about doing things. So from this point, yeah, go ahead. I want to add on top what they were said is that one of the big initiatives as well we're trying to figure out is based on the collective scenarios. Right now, uh, Dave and everybody else who attended the meeting has put a whole bunch of scenarios over there. Uh, based on those scenarios, we came up with a, a white paper or something like that that describes the whole data protection problem for this working group, right? Uh, hopefully come up with something that is reasonable to everyone uh, from different layer. Uh, it's not supposed to provide any like the de detailed design doc like what Angel was doing right now, uh, what, like what Ben's doing right now. It's really to provide uh, a in general, uh, how do we see this problem, right? And then post this problem to the whole working group and to see, to get all the inputs from you guys and to you know make, make it reasonable. Uh, and I still own one doc to this particular discussion group to describe the layers. Uh, I'm working on that. And next meeting, I will be presenting on that. Go ahead, there. I'm done. No, no, it sounds really good. So, um, so we'll schedule another meeting. We'll send it out to the to the list. And in the meantime, the documents here. You know, feel free to either add things in, comment, or you know, if you just want to discuss something via email, you know, either you know one-on-one -on -one, Slack or the, um, the mailing list. I did have a quick question, Dave. Um, in the meeting where we, before we drafted this, uh, you mentioned replication um, and I think you omitted it here. Um, yes, it's not in here yet. Do you? So, do you... Uh, it, is, it is in duplication, replication, there was one, one section for that. Uh, is there, I, I think it, so we were talking about, for example, online, um, I, I tossed out that we might want to handle online real-time replication. Asynchronous a, a replication topic. Yeah, we didn't. I, I don't no. think. So, so feel free to add that, right? I mean, that's that that's a it's a good thing to add in here. Is like we want to have uh, maybe we need to add in things like uh, uh, the RTO RPO objectives and how those are going to affect different scenarios. Yeah, those should be in there. Yeah. Yeah. So we can add um, that. I think. Yeah, I think this scope is very broad. So uh, I, we may not be able to cover all of those, but at least, we we can have a you know, um, 
a high level outline, and then we'll, dis we'll decide how to approach each of them. And some of them we can we make a may come up with more detailed workflows, but others uh, probably will be mm -hmm. like a strategy goal or something, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, 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 yeah, there's a lot of things we just don't even understand yet. So we need to bring them out on the table and, you know, is this in scope? Is this out of scope? Does it make any sense? So um, I think that's where we need to be at this point. Absolutely, yeah. I think non-goals are very powerful, um, you know, so we figure out things that we yeah. don't want to tackle. That yes. <laughs> We're going to start adding some non-goals. That's not a bad idea. Okay. Yeah, so 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 the uh, just the end of the uh, workflow section, right? So there are like several levels of uh, workflows, like volume level that we can look at what Andrew is doing and come up with that. And then application workflow, that's probably will be our focus as well. And then the next is cluster level. And then uh, and there's also data center level, that's probably out of scope for a while, I think. We need to tackle the easiest ones first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, but yeah, so we'll schedule another meeting and uh, uh, sometime early next week, I think. All right, cool. Uh, we're right on time, I guess, by squeezing Dave. <laughs> uh, any questions from the working group? Any comments? Excellent. All right, no? Go ahead, please. Okay. I was just saying thank you for organizing and driving us. Yes, indeed. Thanks thank all. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for attending, and uh, I'll end up the meeting today. Thanks all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Actually, everybody. I think if you just I, did you save this in the cloud or? Yeah, cloud. Okay, great. Okay, so I think if you stop it, it's going to be saved. Yeah. Okay. I thank can, you. Bye. I can stop and all right. Bye bye.